My name is Tom Odiambo. I teach in the Department of Literature at the University of Nairobi. I teach performing arts and media as well. So I've spent my entire lifetime reading books about literature. That's why I teach literature. When we go home, we say we are going to our homeland, right? And that in itself is kind of a literary first. But let's think about the way we conceptualize land. People think largely about it nowadays as property. But uh, um, um, humanity has always considered land as something very close. So think about it from the biblical sense that we come from the soil and we go back into the soil. Think about it that the food we eat comes from the soil. So there is no time at which human beings have never related uh, with the soil. And the way you relate with something is that you create stories about it. So literature generally speaks about human relationship, uh, humans' relationship with land. So if, if you went back to the old oral stories, they were about animals, about how people relate to those animals, and how that relationship is mediated by land because it's the source of livelihood. I mean, we can't say everything. We really want to talk about politics, economics, uh, religion, but all these things come back to what? Resources. And the, the most significant factor of production still remains land. So land determines how we talk about voting patterns, for example, the settlement of people in one region. Land determines how we talk about economic distribution. And all stories you have ever heard. Let me give you an example of uh, the most read African novel, uh, Things Fall Apart. The key story in there is about how you use land to generate wealth and how a break in the relationship between the individual and his land or his clan leads to a breakdown in the person's psyche. So land is key to the way we constitute ourselves. So we can refer to land in many ways. You can refer to it in legal terms, in economic terms, in political terms. But ultimately, it's a story. So people always say, uh, these floods can suit this place for generations, but because the bones of my grandparents are buried here, I'll not leave. And that story sustains them. So that's the story. That's the story of the story of the human being and land. Land is the key factor of of production, right? So to survive, so if you went to the deserts, uh, people have a story of the relationship between themselves and the oasis. So one, we're talking about economic survival. If we're talking about social organization, where do children play? Where do people go to, 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 to relax or rest? If you're talking about spiritual, sense of spiritual organization, what under what tree do people uh, worship, which mountains, under which mountains, what brooks provide a sense of spiritual connection to higher, uh, uh, um, uh, higher um, either gods, their gods, or their ancestors. So there's a broad range, even if you looked at it from a legal perspective, and not, and, and in this case I don't even mean a Euro-legal, Euro-Asian legal perspective, because Africans have their own systems of legally defining their relationship. So if your father um, decided that you are uh, his loved daughter, your loved daughter, and he wants to give you a piece of land, there will be a discussion amongst uh, a council of elders. The best way you can actually talk about that is through literature, through a story. But if you want to talk about it as a social fact, you will run into problems. So the old people would actually tell a story that, oh, we call this place our motherland. Uh, how difficult is it to give my daughter, who is not married, for example, who has decided to stay close to me, land. So um, in a way, land actually enables us to think through a broad range of, uh, of, of subjects. If you're talking about, just for example, uh, people with the mental illnesses, for example, right? Um, it will come down, for example, to lack of appeasement of the ancestors, isn't it? You want to go to a very specific place, which is defined by land, for example, to do a sacrifice or to appease those ancestors. These are things that actually literature, literary writers deal with every single day. 
whether it's literature for young people, literature for children, or other literature. Literature can never be prescriptive. Literature may be descriptive, but literature's job is to provoke you to think a little bit more uh, intensively about how you relate to each subject. So a very simple example like the example of, uh, of uh, uh, the river between. Uh, what is the relationship between the characters and that river which is on land, isn't it? And then what's the symbolic value of the river as something that nourishes people every day, isn't it? Uh, a very simple relationship between this child in weep not child and the land, the displacement this child suffers. Uh, because land gives you a sense of firmness. When you call a place home, it gives you a sense of firmness. So literature writers cannot prescribe. All they want to do is to provoke you and say, if somebody is living in a slum and somebody is living in a 10-acre compound, what exactly, what kind of humanity are we raising? Because human beings are free spirits. There are places in this world where people still roam their lands. And they tell very close stories between themselves and those lands. So literature will always seek to provoke a conversation, like this conversation, which is a conversation whether you are a lawyer, you are a priest, you are a real estate uh, person, you are an economist, you should always think about how do you relate with the land. And just lastly, think about the global warming. It's about our incapacity to relate with the land uh, properly. And there are more than enough stories. So if we extend literature to mean even film, there are more than enough films on how human beings have always thought of land and how we probably in the modern uh, era, we are not thinking much more intensively about our relationship with land. Chinua Achebe. Um, literally all his writing has something, including his last book, There Was a Country, which is really about how Nigerians should deal with the different uh, ethno-linguistic communities because it's about the Biafra war and the, the implicit, implicit idea, if you like, that um, the Igbo actually uh, are defined by a particular space, which is land. Think about Ngugi wa Thiongos. Uh, literally all his books in this country are about the relationship between um, uh, the Kikuyu or Kenyans and their land. The Mau Mau War was nothing but a struggle over a basic factor of production, which is land. Even think about uh, uh, um, uh, somebody like Grace or God. Even just the title of the of the of the of the, of the, the, the story, Land Without Thunder. I mean, the fact that land is actually in that title. So I can name. Um, hundreds, even if we went to Egypt and you said you are reading Nagud Mahfouz and his trilogy on Cairo, it is about how you want to think of Cairo as a space, as a land, right, and how it defines the individual, culturally, spiritually, economically, politically. So I can, I can tell you for a fact that if we sat in a reading session, a literally every text, even if it's a thriller, even if it's a crime text, uh, we can reduce it to a struggle of over resources, isn't it? And where do these resources come from? They come from our relationship with life.